Thank you very much, Samuli. And thanks for inviting me to give this uh, seminar in this uh, really interesting seminar series we have been able to follow for the uh, past couple of months already and still going strong. So my name is Petri Heikinen from Royal Holloway, University of London at the moment. And I am going to present to you today fragility, uh, our work on fragility, fragility of surface states in topological superfluid helium-3. So there's a long list of names here. So we have our experimental group, Royal Holloway. And in the work we have, we are using uh, non-fabricated cells, which have been provided to us by uh, Civac Parpias groups, group at Cornell University. And the theoretical modeling and calculations have been done by uh, Anton Wormsoff at Montana State University and Priya Sarma from uh, Indian Institute of Science. So let's see. All right. So this talk is about superfluid helium-3, which is a paradigm of, for topological superconductivity, which has quite well-known bulk properties. And so far, there are no other candidate systems uh, which would still have, uh, would already have like firmly established, which would be firmly established as uh, topological uh, superconductors uh, other than helium-3. So we use in this work strong confinement, which suppresses the order parameter and removes the bulk properties. And in our geometries, which I will uh, describe in more detail after a moment, uh, 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 it allows the study of uh, impurity free surface pair breaking uh, inside uh, such cavities. And it's expected that exotic bound states, such as Majorana zero modes, live on the surfaces or on the edges of uh, superfluid spaces under confinement. And what we study here are Andrew, uh, non topological Andrew, Andreev bound states understanding of which will be important for realization of these Majorana zero modes in, in the future. Before I move uh, to my or, or to our uh, way of doing these confined studies, I just want to list here several different ways of studying uh, confined, confined helium-3 or studying the surface surfaces of, of superfluid helium. helium. There are, for example, uh, personal oscillators oscillators uh, such as some here. Here where one oscillates um, uh, non-fabricated cavity, for example, for example, and studies how it decouples from the oscillating uh, cell. Then there are capacitive detectors where one can study uh, in films of uh, helium-3 between uh, capacitive plates. Or, for example, one can study uh, in films of uh, helium-3 with interdigitated capacitors, where by the means of electric fields, one can create and control, control the film thickness and uh, flow of helium in, in uh, different thickness of, thicknesses of films. One can also study mechanical resonances uh, in superfluid helium-3 using Helmholtz resonators, or one can study uh, properties of thin films of uh, of helium-3 by having uh, different types of MEMS resonators, resonators where, where some plate is oscillating in close contact to the, the film of uh, helium-3. And one type of study of confinement or distortion is to add pyrogel into superfluid helium-3 sample, where one can, for example, stabilize different uh, phases and uh, see lots of exotic properties. But this is just a brief summary, not going into any of these details. And there are lots of different ways people have used over the years to study surface properties and confinement, such as uh, vibrating wires, film flows, flows, thermal transport, um, uh, like surface specific heat, transfer, transfer acoustic impedance studies, or transfer sound. Also, completely its own topic is the real two-dimensional films, like really atomic layer in films grown on different substrate, substrates. And of course, lots of theoretical work related to all of that. But what is our approach is to confine helium-3 in a well-defined 
a nanofabricated cavity between two silicon fibers, that's the schematically shown here, where it's a single well-defined uh, film, film uh, surrounded by atomically smooth silicon and filled from one end of the sample. But before I move to any of the details of that, I suppose it's uh, necessary to provide some introduction for superfluid helium-3 and especially how the confinement affects uh, its properties. Then I will move on to describe how the boundary condition for quasi-particle scattering changes or affects these uh, confinement properties. And after that, I will uh, provide details of our details of our experimental setup. And in this work, we have used two different cavities, one with height uh, of 200 nanometers and one with height of 80 nanometers. So it's a height of the cavity where the helium tree is confined. And in these thin cavities, the both properties are completely eliminated and the surface effect dominate, uh, dominate, dominate all of the sample properties. So already, uh, one of the results here is we stabilize helium 3A in both cavities. I will provide experimental data to prove that uh, to you all. And in 200 nanometer cavity, we then move on to tune the boundary condition between three different, uh, markedly different uh, uh, boundaries and see how that tuning affects the energy gap suppression and preferred suppression inside the cavity and how it's all is related to the density of states states on the surfaces. And what is the role of zero energy bound states in all this? So let's start with uh, superfluid helium-3. Here on the right, we have a um, base diagram in bulk. So superfluid helium-3 is a P-wave superfluid, which is a spin triplet uh, superfluid with orbital angular momentum of one. And due to this uh, internal stru structure of the Cooper burst, several multiple phases can exist in bulk. Here, helium 3B, which is the low pressure, low temperature phase, and helium 3A, which can exist in uh, at high pressures close to the uh, superfluid transition temperature. And helium 3 samples, and the transition temperatures you see here, it's order of millikelvins. So it exists with pure sample. So at low temperatures, even helium-4 impurities are frozen to the sample walls. So it can be made extremely free of any impurities. So if we bring confinement uh, into the play here, uh, thematically shown here, where we have a box full of helium-3, where the walls are quite close to each other, uh, and the distance between the walls or the height of the cavity is of the order of uh, size of the Cooper burst or size or, or, or the current length, which can be tuned between 20 and 80 nanometers by pressure. So if we confine helium enough, uh, the effect of these walls then ranges over the full sample. So there will be no bulk uh, remaining anywhere inside the cavity. So let's see how it affects the stability of different phases. So at low pressures, low temperatures. In bulk, we stabilize helium 3B, which, which is the pseudo-isotropic time reversal invariant uh, phase, where all combinations of the spin triplet, like spin down-down, spin up-up, and spin up-down, can exist. And also all components of the orbital angular, angular momentum exist. And there is a locking between the orbital and uh, spin decrease of freedom caused by the uh, uh, was by the relative uh, symmetric breaking of, uh, of uh, the relative breaking of spin spin orbital symmetry in helium 3 b If we confine uh, now helium 3 b it starts to create a planar distortion when where close to the boundary, uh, one of these uh, components starts to suppress. So there will be anisotropic pair uh, breaking where Cooper pairs, which have LZ equals zero, so they have momentum against the wall. Uh, so these Cooper pairs start to suppress more. So that cup component goes lower from the bulk value, as shown also here. 
where the LZ component of the bureau closed the wall. So this planar distortion, then when we confine the sample below 10 times the coherence length, so below roughly a micron, or, or well, depending on pressure, pressure to some several few hundreds of nanometers, uh, we cannot create is uh, LZ equals zero pairs at all. So helium free B phase becomes impossible to stabilize. And in that situation, from theoretical point of view, we can create either planar phase or helium free A phase. So these two phases are both uh, spin, equal spin pairing phases, which only have been uh, down down and spin up up, super pairs, but uh, they have different orientations of uh, orbital angular moment uh, possible. In A phase, all the pairs fair, have a constant or, or identical orbital, orbital angular momentum direction, whereas in planar phase, two different combinations are, are possible. So planar phase is just a P phase where one third of the, of the pairs is uh, kind of removed, or this LZ equals zero pairs are, are removed. So the phase diagram looks something like this, where you only stabilize helium-3 planar phase or A phase at zero pressures. But as I will show, we have not seen anything else than helium-3A phase so far down to uh, 80 nanometer confinement. So in weak coupling limit, these two phases, A phase and planar phase are degenerate. And the weak coupling limit uh, only works close to, uh, at low pressures, pre pressures. So if we want to study phase stability uh, as a function of pressure, it's quite instructive first to look at the Kinsbrook Landau uh, uh, formalism, formalism here, where the stability between different phases can be defined by free energy density, where we have the free energy of superfluid phase and free energy of normal phase. And uh, the difference between these two energy densities is given by this uh, simple looking formula, where now B, 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 uh, B parameter uh, is pressure dependent, and that includes, for example, the uh, Innsbruck-Landau B parameters. And now the bigger uh, B is, the more favorable. Well, some phase is, is the form. Form so we can uh, in bulk make this uh, calculation for different uh, phases. Phases using bit the parameters uh, based on lots of experimental data uh, given in this paper. Paper and uh, as expected, in bulk the P phase is a stable one, up to roughly twenty one one bar, and above that the A phase becomes the stable one. And what's Important to know here is that uh, whatever values of the beta parameters one would use, planar phase could never be stable. It's always falls between the B phase and uh, polar phase. But as is known, as we already know, based on earlier results and based on the couple of slides I, I just must have shown, the B phase becomes impossible to stay uh, because becomes impossible to be stable. In strong confinement, so P phase will drop in uh, stability uh, in confinement. It's also known that in some aerosol samples, polar phase uh, becomes a stable one, so it will be the highest of all the phases. So, this in mind, it's not impossible to imagine a situation where beta parameters could change slightly so that the planar phase under some conditions would become favorable over A phase, especially at low pressures where the difference between the phase uh, A and B planar phase is quite small, small when it comes to the Innsbruck landau model. Well, however, however, so far there is no experimental proof of planar stability of planar phase in, in under any, any conditions. There is one uh, experiment from uh, early 90s, 90s where they saw possibly a phase transition, transition in a film thickness of uh, 100 
37 nanometers, and it was reproducible, and it was always happening at the same film thickness. thickness. So there was basically discontinuity in the superfluid density at that thickness. However, the measurements were done by having an oscillating copper plate, and the thin film of helium was grown on the copper plate, and that copper plate had some scratches, deep scratches on it. So it's uh, also possible that that was some experimental experimental uh, error, whatever it was, at least no one else has been able to reproduce this uh, phase transition uh, in, in, in any thin films, in error than even this values here. So now how <clears throat> this uh, confinement is then related to the density of states on the surface. So in bulk, in bulk B phase, which has isotropic energy gap, there are no subcap states. In helium 3A phase, which on the other hand has nodes in its cap st structure, there are these uh, subcap bound uh, uh, states even in bulk. So there is a continuous spectrum, uh, something like this. And as I have shown, the confinement changes the phase stability from helium 3B towards helium 3A. So for helium 3B, whenever we have surface then close to the sample, uh, its spectrum is modified. And there will be a linear uh, dispersion relation of uh, surface bound states going all the way to zero uh, on any surface of helium 3B. And on the other hand, in helium 3A, uh, there will be so-called edge states. So the surface does not change the phase diagram or the density of states of, of, of helium 3A, but it's like two dimensional. If you have two dimensional film, it has this uh, edge on its uh, going around it. On the edge, there will be a flat band of, uh, of bound states. And these both, both forms of bound states are topologically protected and they have shown to, or they are proposed to have exotic, exotic properties, namely in, in helium 3B. They would be Majorana zero modes, and in helium 3A, they would be uh, wild fermions. But what we do in this uh, work is tune, tune the density of uh, the topologically non protected uh, low energy bound states or, or, or Andreev bound states in helium 3A. Okay, and understanding the properties of these low energy bound states will be important and to realize. Uh, properties of these topologically protected states, because one cannot really, in experiments, distinguish these states from each other. So one needs to gain as much understanding from, um, from all the states as possible. So how we then create these non-topologically non non-protected states uh, is to apply roughness at the surface. At the surface. So <clears throat> from theory, vertical point of view, it's known that when you apply any roughness or have any roughness at the surface, you will suppress the gap. You will not only suppress the L set equals zero component, but you will actually suppress all the components of the order parameter. All the, also these L set equals plus minus one pairs will be uh, suppressed by the surface. Surface. So, <clears throat> so we can define or characterize this uh, momentum scattering by <clears throat> parameter, some parameter called specularity parameter S, where it's, if S is one, it's fully specular sample where the uh, scattering is uh, mirror-like. So the positive particles don't really, uh, well, they gather like from mirror, mirror and there is no additional pair breaking caused by the surface in helium 3A case. So this L set, equals plus minus one pairs, they don't feel the surface. On the other hand, when you have S equals minus one, which means complete backscattering, then you have maximal, maximal pair breaking and all the components of the uh, order parameter go to zero at the walls. So as much, uh, so as much additional pair, pair breaking is uh, uh, lost as possible. And somewhere in between, we have a diffuse boundary, which is completely random scattering. And that also suppresses all the uh, or the parameter components, but not as much as the retroreflective one uh, would be. 
So this is uh, how it works in theory. How can we then study these properties in, in practice? Is by adding helium-4 into helium-3 sample. So if we have pure helium-3, first of all, uh, we have liquid helium-3 and few atomic layers next to the surface form a magnetically ordered solid layer of helium-3. Then uh, addition of helium-4, helium-4 is heavier and so it has large, uh, smaller zero point motion. So it's favorable over the surfaces. And eventually if you have enough helium-4 in the sample, you will create a two dimensional superfluid helium-4 film between the liquid helium-3 and the solid surface. So we can tune the boundary properties from solid helium-3 towards, or the boundary condition from solid helium-3 to superfluid helium-4. And it has been shown that this tuning can change the boundary condition between diffuse, which is kind of a solid randomly scattering surface, rough surface, to all the way to specular, where the superfluid helium-4 film provides mirror-like uh, scattering for the quasi-particles. And it has been also shown that when this specularity actually kicks in, it's roughly at the same, at the same thickness of helium-4 form where the superfluid, superfluid film is, is really formed. So this range we can reach uh, by changing the amount of helium-4 in the sample. And what, what's interesting, in the situation where we do not have any helium-3 in the sample is the magnetic property of the boundary. So the solid helium-3, since it's magnetically active, paramagnetic layer, it can provide an additional scattering channel, a channel which uh, also breaks pairs. So there will be momentum scattering and magnetic scattering combined in these kind of samples. So let's see, just a brief summary. What we what have been already learned um, from these kind of studies. So earlier, uh, silicon analytically bonded silicon class cavities were used with two, two different thicknesses, 1100 or 700 nanometers, and this is how the cavities looked like. Looked like so you can can see the cavity through the glass part of the of the paper. So what was detected? For example, in 700 nanometer high cavity was the modification of phase diagram so that at low pressures only the helium 3A phase was uh, possible, but all, at some higher pressures the helium 3B phase was also stable. So it was possible to probe the uh, AP phase transition as a function, function of uh, or with, with different uh, boundary conditions. It was also possible to see in such samples what's the coexistence of two different E phase in orbit orientations or, uh, or uh, so called stable and metastable D phase where the frequency shift was uh, negative or positive depending on the spin orbit interaction energy. energy. And these states could even coexist, in which case there was so called textural domain wall, wall between these two. two in orbit uh, orientations of the phase. Other type of domain walls, walls which were, uh, which also were possibly stabilized in such samples are uh, more fundamental domain walls where one of these uh, components of the helium planar distort, planarly distorted helium 3P phase changes sign between plus and minus and, and uh, I want to point, point out in here that these domain walls are completely different than these domains wall, domain walls. So here, this domain wall is textural domain wall is textural domain wall caused by only change in spin, spin orbit interaction energy between uh, this plus and minus side. And here, the domain walls wall is more like a cosmological domain wall where the actual phase is different. So it's not just the same phase between plus and minus, but it's different superfluid order parameter on plus and on minus side. So these domain walls are different type of domain walls, walls but both uh, can, can be stabilized in, in, uh, in such cavities. 
And well, for example, stripe phase is the one, one of the phases which has been purely predicted to exist in cavities. But so far, the experimental data favors more like a polka dot uh, type uh, structure of the domain walls. But no more details on that. Let's move on to our current experiments. So cells we use now are silicon silicon cells, and they can only stabilize, they cannot stabilize B phase. So we do not study B phase here, here at all. Also, two cavity heights used, 192 and 80. And one relative value, those is the so-called is so-called reduced reduced thickness. So since we can tune the coherence length or the size of the Cooper pairs by pressure, we can change the effective height of the cavity. In 192 nanometer high cavity, that value can change between two and a half and five. And in 80 nanometer high cavity, we can tune the value between uh, one and 2.2. So we really reach all the way down to the quasi dimensional limit where the cavity height equals the size of the Cooper pairs. In these cavities, we also have bulk markers, bulk volumes on both ends of the cavity to characterize the thermal gradients across this uh, really tiny uh, uh, narrow cavity. And it has been shown that this thermal gradient is really small, only 0 to 20 microkelvins, depending on the, on the boundary condition for uh, quasiparticle scattering. And this then can be easily taken into account as uh, error or uncertainty in the, in the temperature determination. So in, in such cavities, we can cool helium-3 down to roughly 500 microkelvins in our uh, nuclear demagnetization cryostat. And we study is uh, frequency shifts or like or, or the suppression of superfluidity using pulsed NMR. But since our sample size is really small, like order of nanoliter, we need squid-based spectrometer to measure or detect such uh, tiny signals arising from such tiny samples. And inside the cavity, we have a regular array of uh, pillars. And these pillars are to support the cavity so that under when we have high pressure of helium inside, the cavity doesn't bow too much. So in silicon glass cells, the bowing was more than 20 nanometers per bar. And here, simulations give a number with roughly two and a half nanometers per bar uh, bowing. And again, that can be taken into account as uh, uncertainty of cavity height uh, in our experiments. So the 80 nanometer high cavity looks exactly the same, except it has uh, now fabricated parentheses on both sides of the cavity to work to, to provide volume for the bulk bulk. So here we have two holes on both sides of the cavity, and here we have these trenches, which are are there in order to work uh, as a marker for for bulk overflow transitions. So first, let's study a specular boundary condition. So boundary condition where, where we have lots of helium-4 added into the sample, and we have this superfluid helium-4 boundary, uh, uh, boundary everywhere. So it's expected to, we are expecting to see bulk-like behavior, and no suppression of superfluidity under such, uh, such, uh, uh, such uh, boundary conditions. So here we have an example measurement in 80 nanometer cavity. And here on the right, example data set from 192 nanometer high cavity. That's the same pressure and with same boundary condition. So they have different amount of helium-4 nominally, but in both cases, it's thick enough to create a superfluid helium-4 film. So boundary condition wise, it would be the same. And one important thing to notice here already is we have from cavity signal, which is this brightest peak on the left, in both cases, we always see negative frequency shift. And this negative frequency shift is completely reproducible. We have never seen any different frequency shift than negative, and it always retains its amplitude. So the amplitude of the peak does not decrease. And that's sorry, is... Patrick. Yes. Um, I think Sivke has uh, her hand up. Maybe there is a question. Yes, I didn't see that. It's on my different screen. That's fine. Hi. Sorry about that. Uh, it was much earlier. 
um, I thought I'd ask it at the end. It was just you when you had, you said in helium 3B surface um, exhibits a linear dispersion. My question would have been, what's the speed, the propagation speed of, can you also ask a very, I'm sorry if this is a, a trivial question, but I'm not sure you don't have a free surface, right? So these are not, are these surface waves or just two dimensional sound waves? Or how do you think of these excitations? So, so in our situation, we do not study uh, surface, uh, free surfaces. So we don't have surface waves. So it's completely static sample. So there is no movement. So what we study is the NMR properties or the magnetization. Like oh, okay. the, how the, the precession of spins inside a confined helium tree. So, so yeah, we have no excitations, no sound waves, or, or anything. No, 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 no such excitations, excitations in our, our situation here. Yes, that's, that's a good, good uh, question and uh, probably good thing to point out that, yes, it's uh, magnetic properties we are studying or the precession of spins of the Cooper pairs in, okay. in superfluid. Sorry, state. I misunderstood. Thank you very much. No worries. So, uh, so uh, it's a constant amplitude, and that that is of course expected for equal spin bearing phase, such as uh, helium three A phase. A phase is, and the bulk markers they always have positive frequency shift as any bulk helium 3A or helium 3B should have. And so here we have two bulk markers clearly visible after, before they disappear here, here around uh, point, <clears throat> close to 0.75 millikelvin. And in this 80 nanometer cavity, the bulk marker is really hard to see, but it's there, it's there and uh, it has a transition temperature of DC not here, uh, which is slightly higher than the DC in the cavity. But one of the problems actually, at the, uh, which is still uh, unexplained, is the disappearance of the bulk markers. That even with this kind of well fabricated frequencies, our bulk markers are not as visible as we would expect them to be. And the bulk signal always disappears quite soon below the PC, which is not, again, uh, not something one would expect for bulk uh, helium 3, 3 uh, to do under such, uh, such volumes. volumes. But yes, we are trying some different designs in the next generation of cells and, and we will see uh, what happens to the bulk markers in, in such situations. So, <clears throat> then now we have this frequency shift, which in uh, this kind of small confinement where the height of the cavity is much smaller than the dipolar uh, healing length, the precession of, of, uh, of the magnetization can be fully uh, determined by the aver by average value of the energy gap inside, uh, inside this cavity. And uh, here, well, this uh, frequency shift now depends on the superfluid phase. It also depends on the uh, configuration or relative orientation between spin magnetic field and orbital angular momentum. In our situation, they all are pointing towards the uh, surface. So they all are perpendicular to the cavity surface. And that results, if we only concentrate here on the two possible relevant phases, uh, they correspond to two frequency shifts, where it's in A phase or metastable planar phase, which is this kind of metastable orientation of in orbit uh, interaction in planar phase, the frequency shift is a negative and has the same uh, magnitude for both. If we, on the other hand, were able to stabilize, sta stabilize the planar phase in its stable spin orbit uh, orientation, the frequency shift would be positive, but would have the exactly same magnitude. But as I said already, we only ever see negative frequency shift in our NMR, NMR experiments. So we can uh, say we have never been able to see stable interface in our experiments. On the other hand, metastable phases should be only possible to stabilize more like a stochastic way 
that uh, they possibly would be created randomly, or if they were stabilized everywhere, uh, every time, that usually would be uh, uh, only as a, as a combined effect of magnetic field and maybe some pinning of uh, of uh, face boundaries on scratches of the on the surfaces. But since we have really smooth surfaces, and since we even tried to uh, cool down or even cool down to the superfluid transition in zero magnetic field before ramping the field up extremely carefully not to hit the sample. And even in that case, we saw negative frequency shift with, with, with the same uh, magnitude as the A phase or, or as the, uh, normal experiments we do. In, in that sense, we really do not believe that we have ever seen even a metastable planar phase in, in our uh, confined samples. So now, from now on, let's just concentrate on A phase and accept that that is the A phase we, we have in the cavity. So now, if we study this negative frequency shift from the A phase, uh, we can extract this uh, spatial average energy gap uh, from our measured frequency shifts. And here, we, uh, I'm blocking this uh, energy gap for three different uh, pressures and comparing it to the expected values of, of uh, energy gap for bulk helium 3A and also some uh, peculiarities, some, some peculiarity with, peculiarities which are, are close to, to bulk. And both of these cavities, 80 and 192, they agree with each other within the uncertainty. And at low pressures, the agreement with bulk theory is uh, rather perfect. Here is the difference between the theory line and data. And at high pressures, there is some uh, deviation between the theory and data. And this is because, believed to be because of the strong coupling uh, corrections. So the theory lines here are weak coupling uh, calculations, which are scaled to match the strong coupling uh, experiments close to the TC or yeah, close to the TC. So they do not have any strong coupling temperature dependence in calculations. Uh, but uh, Tim Sols has provided some preliminary calculations for temperature dependent strong coupling in helium 3A. Uh, these calculations do not, do not take the helium 3A cap profile fully into account. So they are not complete yet, but already one can see that such calculations with much better match uh, with experimental data, data already already uh, at this, uh, five and a half bar pressure, for example. So it's it's hoped that at some point full calculations for healing three A A uh, regarding the strong coupling corrections will exist exist and we can convert these to these theories uh, completely. So <clears throat> that was about uh, frequency shifts uh, in in the specular case in 80 and 192 nanometer high cells. Here, uh, another important aspect is the suppression of TC. So is there any change in the superfluid transition temperature uh, down to these really highly confined samples? And we do not see any suppression. So here, phase diagram of pressure, pressure versus temperature, the transition temperature really falls onto, onto expected uh, bulk superfluid transition line. Same data, different coordinates. So we have the relative uh, transition temperature versus this effective cavity height. And here it's seen that there is some suppression from the expected bulk behavior, really tiny, maximally two persons, uh, persons in this 80 nanometer uh, cavity, cavity, and they more or less match with uh, specularities, which are somewhere between 0.97 and 0.98. So we can create almost fully perfect perfectly specular sample and the possible deviation from full specularity might be because some of our superfluid helium core is able to flow out from the cell because the fill line is open open uh, to the higher temperatures temperatures so it's possible that not really all the helium core is uh, is inside the cell but regardless this is uh, really close to non suppressed uh, superfluid inside tiny cavities 
and uh, as to show, we are already below this uh, Swan Kruger paper phase transition limit, which was 137 nanometers or roughly 1.8 in the effective uh, cavity height. So we do not see anything weird with these points. So there's absolutely no detected transitions within our range of, uh, of, uh, of effective cavity thicknesses. One last uh, way of probing phases is to study tipping angle dependence. So tipping uh, helium-3 with some large angles, more than the usual uh, U decrease one uses uh, to probe the frequency shift. And for A phase, and also this metastable planar phase, it's directly proportional to the negative of the pole sign uh, of the dipping angle. Since we have some unexplained heating present in the in the sample, we cannot use high amplitude pulses. Instead, we use long pulses, which are always equal in total length. We have this kind of anti-pulse pulse method where at some point we have 180 degree phase shift in the pulse and the effective uh, tipping can be tuned for con uh, constant long, uh, well, total length is always the same, but effective tipping is the different, which is the red part in the, in, in the, in the end. So we have phase shift which kind of cancels the first part of, of the pulse and then it starts to really uh, do the effective tipping. Uh, well, this has its drawbacks, which is basically that we need to use long pulses and this makes, uh, this means that it's uh, spectral width is quite narrow and also uh, there will be some significant phase shifting between the processing and moving helium signal and the pulse. Also the error bars get really large when the tipping gets uh, significant. So for that reason we have been only able to probe tipping angles up to 50 to 60, 60 degrees. But so far none of the data shows any deviation from the expected A-phase behavior uh, which is basically extrapolation to the 90 degree tipping or sine beta to zero, where the frequency shifts to zero. So all our data uh, for different pulse uh, amplitudes and lengths extends to, to the same expected A phase behavior. So just one more parameter to, to prove that uh, it is A phase or everything in our uh, cavity behaves as, as expected for bulk A phase. or as expected for confined A phase. So in 200 nanometer cavity, we then tune the boundary conditions to also something else than specular. So we studied a pure helium-3 sample, which has only a small amount of impurities. And we also study so-called uh, solid helium-4 sample, where we can create the diffuse boundary condition by having uh, not enough helium-4 to, to fo form the superfluid layer, but enough to form a solid layer, which uh, removes this magnetic helium free from the boundaries. And uh, in each of those cases, we can then can probe these uh, frequency shifts and different superfluid transitions uh, in different parts of the sample. So the bulk is always the uh, bulk determined by the bulk marker transitions, but the PC in the cavity changes heavily. Uh, as a function of a uh, boundary condition. In, in these two cases, when we have helium-4 in the sample, it's really easy, sharp uh, negative shift, which kicks in. So the PC determination is easy. With solid helium-3, the magnetic layer causes its own frequency shift, which is also negative. So uh, solid contribution needs to be removed first before we can really extract the, the transition in the in the superfluid. So it's not really seen in the score plot. There is no sharp transition, but I'm not going into details here. Details here. I'm just showing that one, one can remove the solid contribution and then also this uh, light blue data, which is now the same, uh, the solid helium free data with solid contribution uh, removed. It also has a sharp kink uh, in superfluid uh, in, in, in the frequency shift. And this DC or super, this uh, superfluid transition here is much lower than uh, with uh, solid helium-4 or superfluid helium-4 on the boundaries. And yeah, so 
And this all is because this uh, solid helium four or three layer is magnetic, uh, has highly temperature dependent magnetization, and that results in its own uh, uh, additional frequency shift. But I'm not going to go too much into, into those details. So now I already showed the uh, phase diagrams in specular case or the TC suppression in specular case for these two cavities. Now in this 192 nanometer cavity, let's add diffuse uh, suppression of uh, superfluidity, suppression of TC uh, with a diffuse boundary condition, and that is uh, much clearly suppressed from the bulk uh, values, and it nicely falls close to the fully diffuse line with the solid green line. But if one really calculates uh, uh, different uh, suppressions, our data best matches the specularity of 0.1, which is uh, quite close to diffuse, but is slightly less suppressed than diffuse. However, if we then add points measured with solid helium-3 boundary condition, we see much more suppressed uh, transition temperatures, much more suppressed than diffuse. And we can phenomenologically describe this as uh, having specularity minus 0.4. But in purely momentum scattering, this would mean that we have uh, we have like a retroreflective, partially retroreflective surface where a significant portion of the quasi particles is, is our spack scattering. It's hard to imagine such geometric uh, scattering happening in our sample where we have extremely smooth, ultimately smooth silicon surfaces. So the back scattering is most likely not the reason why suppression is so much. So then the natural uh, conclusion is that magnetic properties of such boundaries need to be taken into account. And this is something which has been also detected in, in aerosol that having magnetic boundaries or pure helium-3 samples, the, the phase diagram in the aerosol uh, changes and the stability of different phases is affected by, by this magnetically active boundary condition. Yep, so let's not go that at all here. So now we had suppression of superfluid transition temperature. We also have naturally then suppression of superfluid, superfluid uh, energy gap, which is different for specular and diffuse boundary conditions. So this specular data I already showed before, together with uh, uh, this 80 nanometer cavity. Now I've added here diffuse data, data points at two pressures. And we can uh, then again convert this uh, extracted mean values of the energy gap uh, in the cavities to calculations. And at low pressures, at zero bar, although the amount of data is limited, we see that it matches best theory corresponding to specularity 0.1. Same thing also happens at five and a half bar if one assumes there is similar strong coupling, coupling corrections, which would be needed between the uh, 0.1 calculation for 0.1 and, and the data set. And this now means that we have a consistent picture where from the quasi classical theory, we do get similar, uh, we could we could get agreement for both uh, suppression of energy gap and suppression of the transition temperature, which, uh, which uh, in diffuse case, both if the value 0.1 as a best match, uh, match for the data. What we cannot explain so far is what happens when we try to extract the energy, gap, the mean gap value with the solid helium three on the boundaries. So there it seems that the gap suppression is much less, so the gap, gap value remaining in the, in the cavity is much higher than what one would expect to these kind of uh, theories using the specularity Minus of minus 0.4. The data quality uh, here is uh, the data here has large uncertainties. It's very poss much possible that there is some systematic error here when we are when we are removing a, a solid contribution. So, but it's also possible that this magnetically active boundary condition just cannot uh, just 
provides different level, level of cap suppression one what it's kind of a regularity based model will, alone would give uh, and for this reason we are planning to study this uh, a bit more detail at lower magnetic fields where we can minimize the solid contribution and maximize the superfluid contribution and from such experiments we should get much higher quality, quality data for the frequency shift uh, of in, in the superfluid, superfluid alone alone and then uh, after that we can maybe re-address uh, this question to see how the data actually, actually looks like so now just a couple of use uh, last slides to make a connection between uh suppression of the energy gap and is a low energy bound states. So I already mentioned that in both B and A phase, there are these topologically protected uh, surface and edge states. Edge states, And what we have done here is then to create these non-topological uh, bound states uh, by tuning the surface boundary, uh, certain surface scattering condition. condition. And uh, what we then get from the quasi-classical theory is that the suppression of the gap from specular, the uh, suppression of the gap is highly dependent on the boundary condition. So it can be changed between specular, which uh, provides the bulk gap, all the way down to retroreflective, which gives highly suppressed energy gap. And then how this uh, suppression of the energy gap or this boundary condition is related to the uh, energy of the surface bound states comes from a uh, such uh, equation where the surface, the energy of the surface bound states is determined by uh, phi here, which is so, well, it's not scattering angle, it's a scattering phase. Basically this uh, phase defines how quasi particles which scatter see the order parameter. And what's important is whether this phase changes upon, upon scattering. And in helium 3A phase, uh, that's as we have, the surface scattering, uh, scattering phase is, is, is actually rotates, rotation uh, on xy plane in momentum space during the scattering. So if you have specular, specular scattering on xy plane, there is no rotation. So the quasiparticle so particle continues to the same xy direction, and the phase is uh, zero, meaning there are no additional surface bound states. So the energy of surface bound states would be the uh, same as in bulk. So this, this term uh, remains one. On the other hand, when we have retroreflective uh, surface where its phase is phi, because all the quasi particles scatter back to the same x, y direction they came from. And in that case, this term would be zero and the bound state energies would be zero. So this is, uh, of course, what the calculations then uh, provide. So at the surface of such cavity, one can see density of states changing as the specularity changes uh, from bulk or fully specular towards the fully retroreflective phase, which is the black one here on the back. And in such case, there is huge accumulation of zero energy bound states. Bound states. So this theory now connects, connects the density of bound states to the boundary condition. And in that way, the suppression of uh, superfluid transition temperature and suppression of energy gap. And since we now, with solid heating three on the surfaces, measure pair breaking or suppression, which is more than diffuse, that then within this theory, theoretical frame, uh, framework would mean we have an increased, increased density of zero energy bound states uh, on, on the surface in that situation. And now uh, on the last slide, this phase uh, I presented was for momentum scattering alone, alone, but in general, it can be also modified by a magnetic decrease of freedom on the surface. So now if we look at possible mechanism, mechanisms which cause this kind of additional pair breaking or accumulation of zero energy bound states on the, on the surface, uh, we could have this backscattering, this retroreflective case. Well, this like I said, it's hard to imagine with extremely atomically smooth silicon surfaces. So we rule that out as a possibility for, for additional pair breaking in our samples. Uh, other option would be 
have like spin dependent scattering where one would imagine a ferromagnetic magnetic layer, for example, then have a magnetic scattering from that or, or magnetically active scattering. Uh, but such uh, layer would only affect spins spin up down up down pairs, not pairs which have uh, spin up up or spin down 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 down. So helium three A has A phase has only these Cooper pairs. So such Cooper pairs would have would would not feel the magnetism of the surface. So they would no not suffer for from any extra pair breaking. Uh, so the third possible mechanism, most interesting. Uh, of these ones here now, or most relevant for us, is so-called magnetic exchange scattering, where the quasi-particles can exchange spin, spin with the surface layer. It's important to note here that this surface boundary is consists of helium-3 atoms, with solid helium-3, and the quasi-particles are also coming from the superfluid helium-3. So it's uh, highly expected there is some interaction between this helium-3 in the superfluid and helium-3 in the solid. And if then uh, this interaction is taken into account, one can create additional pair breaking. So here is a, is a, it's a plot showing what this uh, theory can provide. So all the lines here are DC suppression lines as a function of uh, effective confinement for purely momentum scattering, ranging all the way from retroreflective to close to specular. And then symbols are what calculates, uh, calculations using this uh, spin flip exchange scattering provide. So depending on the model parameters one uses in, in calculations, one can recreate all the different levels of suppressions. And now these, all these calculations uh, correspond to the situation where the surface itself is fully specular. So momentum scattering does not provide any fair breaking here. All these symbols uh, are having are only showing pair breaking caused by by the magnetic exchange scattering, and that's it's actually an important point here. This for this mechanism to be effective, it needs the surface to be something else than diffuse, since the effect is specularity, which is the combination of momentum and magnetic scattering, is between minus s and s, where s is now the momentum scattering alone. If s is zero. And uh, magnetic scattering cannot change that anywhere else. So one would need partially specular boundary to have some visible effect from this uh, uh, magnetic scattering. But we believe that in our system, where we have atomically smooth surfaces uh, with pure helium-3 in the sample, we can have such non-diffusive non uh, momentum scattering, which is kind of underlying scattering before this magnetic scattering kicks in, but it's impossible for us, us to determine or separate these two effects from each other. But we only see the outcome, final results, final suppression, which uh, then should, uh, in, in this model would be a combination of both mechanisms uh, working together. And none of these calculations, uh, this is just showing what theory can provide, but to, know, to apply such theories for any particular experiment, one would need to know microscopics of the surface and micro microscopics of the interaction between the solid and, and these quasi particles. And such microscopics are not uh, known at the moment. So, moment, it's a theory which can provide uh, additional suppression, and that's why it makes it uh, kind of intriguing, intriguing to our our uh, experimental uh, results. So, time to finish, we can stabilize A phase down to zero pressure in 80 nanometer, nanometer confinement, meaning down to quasi two dimensional limit. Then we can control the boundary condition uh, at the level of superfluid suppression by changing the, changing the uh, amount of helium-4 in the sample. And this is in good agreement with classical theory, which also in an implies implies that, that the energy spectrum of the surface pump states is uh, sensitive to such, such tuning. And we see additional pair breaking when we have magnetically active or magnetic layer of solid helium-3 on the boundaries. And this is possibly, possibly this can possibly be explained by spin exchange scattering between these helium-3 quasi-particles and uh, solid helium-3 atoms. 
And what we want to do next is then to study in lower magnetic fields, the solid helium and three boundary conditions, better understand magnetic pair breaking. And uh, more uh, in the future, the plan is to fabricate uh, more hybrid nanofluidic nano, nano structures where cavity is not just a uh, simple thickness anymore, but instead we can uh, have a well-defined base boundaries between uh, different uh, parts of the cavity by changing the cavity height, or, or for example, have isolated uh, areas where the cavity height is different and have this kind of isola isolated uh, faces in the middle of the, like isolated superfluid phase, middle of the normal phase, uh, as one possible example. example. And such structures hopefully help uh, studying the, or, or gaining control of the surface and edge states and also to study, we could study thermal and spin transport in, in such devices and also an anomalous thermal hole effect uh, as uh, one possible interesting example. I suppose uh, that's all I wanted to say today. So thank you for listening and I guess I'm ready to take questions if you have any. Thank you, Petri. Um, yeah, I'm sorry we ran a little bit over uh, the, the, the one hour we usually have. Uh, reserved for this seminar but but uh, and so i would start by saying that the next presentation will be given by uh, jiva Papia in two weeks time for those of you uh, who may have to leave at this time um now i think well i have no idea which order these these questions appeared but uh, i will start from bill please Hi, Petri. Uh, I'd like to ask you about this last point, the anomalous thermal hall effect. Uh, how would you measure the temperature in this case? <clears throat> well, that's a good question. So one would need a local thermometry in, in such cavities. So one would need to know the temperature in more locally than what we know, what we know now. So there are several uh, different mechanisms we have been discussing, haven't yet tested them. One would be, for example, having a, uh, like different bulk A phase markers in different parts of the sample and measure NMR signal from those. Or one could have, for example, miniature noise thermometers uh, applied into the cell. So you would have like additional holes entering into the cell volume and you would measure temperature more locally uh, by having several thermometers connected to the, the cell volume. Like, uh, those are like a couple of examples one could use. Thank you very much. All right. Um, maybe Silke next. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, I have a simple question. You said the confinement in terms of psi naught, but what is yes. some physical scale? How do you calculate it? Where do you get that from? So, so in physical, so psi naught is. Uh, like it's a coherence length, so it's the size of the Cooper burst pairs in, in helium three, and that is between 20, well, roughly between 20 and 80 nanometers, depending on pressure. So it's uh, 80 nanometers or close to 80 at zero pressure, and it's close to 20 at uh, roughly 30 bar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think John Davis probably was the next one. Please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about slide 15. Actually, two quick questions about slide 15. So here in the in the in the middle one where you have the solid. So first I don't quite understand why you have a bulk A and a bulk B. Okay, well, first uh, I can answer that question. So in these bulk markers, so if we look at the Cavities themselves. So, uh, so this is the cavity yeah. used in this this particular measurement. So, in in fill line, which is connected to the huge volume of bulk helium, which is used to fill the sample, we always have helium three B phase because that's the stable phase in 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 well, it's basically it's a stable yeah. phase in such conditions. But in this kind of far end bulk marker, which zip, which doesn't see any other bulk uh, helium, it only sees the cavity. We can sometimes supercool helium three A phase. It's so it, yeah, it's supercooled helium three A phase. So in that particular example uh, of the scholar plot, it's 
it's more random. So it's sometimes A phase, it's sometimes B phase, but uh, so that we ourselves know what it is, we have made this comparison between bulk A and bulk B that always follows one of those two options. So, so then in the specular, you actually have a fourth curve that you don't point out. Yes, so so here again, fill line is B phase. In the far end bulk marker, for some reason, I cannot fully explain. In this case, the, the bulk signal divided. So this is actually B phase and this is A phase. So it somehow shows uh, two phases. So it's possible that because this bulk marker is not like nanofabricated bulk markers. So uh, it's just a hole which we have blocked by having this kind of washer or just a plug on it. So it's possible that there are some tiny volumes or some significant uh, volumes of a, a kind of confined but still bulk helium-3 that are not really seeing each other so that you have some divided signal arising from this uh, rather complicated volume. We haven't seen anything like this when we have it's not more like uh, fabricated uh, None of fabricated, more, more like none of fabricated fences, which are connected to each other from the end. So the, the single volume. So they should have only one phase existing. But here, yeah, it's true. Uh, what you pointed out, it's a uh, kind of two bulk signals arising from the same volume. Mm. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, now I'm going to guess that Peter probably was the next one. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Petri, thank you uh, for the nice talk. I have a question similar to Bill Halperin regarding to NMR. In your case, when you did your past NMR experiment, you should have a spin supercurrent to flow in your sample, I think. Can you comment on this? Did you consider it this effect or not? Uh, we have not really considered this effect, or in in what point of view you mean? What what would you expect? Because because when you do a pulse NMR, you should have a spin in homogeneity in the spin part of the order parameter. You have a different deflection because of dipole energy, and then you should have a spin supercurrent to establish in your system. Always yeah. like that. Yes, yes, yes. But should that be really visible in NMR, where where one probes the frequency shift uh, of the overall sum overall sample by having the like the receiver coil around the full full cavity? Mm -hmm. Would you really see spin current? I don't in, know. It's in, a question in, in, for in, you. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 that's, well, that's kind of counter question that I wouldn't expect to see such spin currents in in the cavity where what we are probing like the cavity as a whole. It's, it's a question of the time scale because you, for example, you did not show uh, uh, the signal you measured. What was the, uh, the length of the signal of your free induction decay of the spin? Yes, because I you don't did have... the pulse and MR, I, I guess. Yes. So, uh, so the time, time, uh, like the E two star, like the decay time is order of five to ten milliseconds. Yeah. So the signal. That, case uh, within and you have a frequency of one megahertz something like that right yes yeah. one megahertz close to one megahertz exactly anyways it, this uh, spin supercurrents distributed magnetization in your system so but you simply did not consider this effect uh, so. uh not not in this uh, these experiments okay thank you yeah. just only a question just a comment thank you very yeah. much all right thank you pisa uh i think ego was the next one uh, go ahead please Yes, uh, thank you, Petri, for the nice talk. I have uh, actually three questions, <laughs> if I'm allowed to. <clears throat> yeah. So first, yes, uh, yeah, I was puzzled that you have quite a small depression of the critical temperature, although your height of the slab is very small compared to the uh, to the coherent lengths, while people obtained quite significant uh, depression of TC even in one micrometer slab 
I'm talking now about this Kawaii at all work from 1998. Can you explain? I, I would expect that you would greatly suppress your TC because it was suppressed even in one micrometer slab down to 0.25 millikelvin. I can't remember now. So, so, uh, so we, so are you saying that you think we don't have enough suppression or that? I, 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 yes, I am puzzled that you have uh, too, too small suppression. Yes. Okay, well, uh, that's uh, an interesting, interesting uh, uh, take, but we, we definitely, we have significant suppression as seen here. Uh, yeah, it's not down to 0.2 microcalvins or anything like that. But uh, what the suppression is that it, it, it at least matches the quasi-classical calculations or, or, for example, this uh, one uh, older calculations, which is a uh, uh, diffuse uh, PC suppression by KKR, like this uh, et al. al paper, so which is actually this diffuse line here. So our suppression at least matches all the early and even more recent calculations. So I don't know where would it arise that it should be more more than this. For, uh, uh, and of course, it depends on the boundary condition, but the diffuse is usually the maximum suppression people have detected in the past, which would be this yeah. green line. OK, I was talking about Kawaii work from 1998. One can find it. Uh, OK. Thank you. Yeah. Second, second question is, uh, you only have pressure of five bar. Why don't higher? And you have so small slab that you can have 50 bar, 100 bar, because the solid will be uh, like, uh, solid will not appear due to capillary effect. So you may have much like uh, a richer phase diagram and comparison to your theory. Why only five bar? So oh, that's, a, that's a very, very relevant question, actually. So 5.5 5 bar, 5 .5 bar was something used earlier. So, so we stuck to the same. And why we didn't go higher originally was the, well, one of the reasons is uh, cells are not tested to high pressures. Many of the cells we have pulled down. So there's a fear that at some point it will fail, either the connection of the fill line or the cell itself, but most likely, if anything, it would be the fill line, which is just epoxy on the on the silicon. Silicon, but actually, what we are doing at the moment in the lab uh, is taking measurements up to higher pressures, uh, above ten bar, probably somewhere. Well, we will decide this week what pressure we will probe, but most likely it will be twelve bar to fifteen bar or something like that uh, as a first starting point. So yeah, we are moving towards uh, higher pressure in, in these experiments, exactly for that reason, to get a more complete picture of the, of the properties. Yeah, thank you. A uh, very short one more question, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about the TC, did you see uh, any sign of hysteresis when you go up and down in temperature? Can you say something on this? <laughs> Yes, yes. So, so we have measured both up and downs, and the hysteresis we see is a order of similar order of the or, or as the temperature gradient across the cell. So it's it's like zero to ten, zero to ten to twenty microkelvins at maximum at the at the rates we have using. So no significant hysteresis. Of course, no significant we, hysteresis. Yeah, like like order of ten microkelvin. Not, yeah. not higher than that. Of Thank course, you if, very much. If we Thank do you. really, really fast sweeps, we probably would have some hysteresis, but that might be just technical problem, not real result. Because of course, we need to do lots of averaging of data, data and so on. So we need to be limited in our sweep rates, not to have too fast temperature sweeps. But we haven't seen any hysteresis with slow, slow sweep rates. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. All right, thank you, Igor. Um, Grisha is the next one. Uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, the question is, uh, do you have domain walls in uh, your system? Uh, I think you should have. Uh, if you don't have, you, you can do it by quench. Uh, have you seen something like that? So 
we have not seen any domain walls. walls you probably mean helium 3a phase domain walls phase, between, yes. between different like uh, L, L orientation so we haven't seen any any domain walls in in our experiments i don't know should they even be visible in in the nmr or what we do at the moment even if they existed existed but uh yeah at least we do not have any any indication of, of the main walls in these cavities but what happened if you make a quench quench uh well that's a good question uh something we haven't actually tried maybe that is uh, something we should should try see if anything changes you probably how quickly can you cool it down I mean... yeah the time scale is wrong Talking about like kibbles are kind of vortices, the time scales are wrong for what we can do in DMAG. This is why those 80, 1987 papers were done with um, neutron deposition. Grisha, you were on one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. That can we really cool it down fast enough, enough if it's uh, because there is some significant time delay for this confined helium three to in, inside the cavity to cool down. Okay, thanks. Um, then there is um, another question by Choi or whatever the way, the way to pronounce your name. Please go ahead. Hi, Petri. Uh, Sorry. I, ha I have one question about uh, slide 21, where you have this uh, calculation on magnetic suppression. Yes. So the calculation shows magnetic suppression in a specular condition. Exactly, yes. Which is a little confusing because I would think that in specular condition, you have helium-4 coated on the surface, hence you don't get a lot of magnetic suppression. Okay, so, uh, so calculation here, it assumes some underlying momentum specularity. It doesn't, it assumes that you have the magnetic uh, boundary it assumes you have some momentum scattering. So situation mm -hmm. is something like here. So it's another question, can one create such condition in reality? You would have fully specular uh, momentum scattering, but you would still have fully effective magnetic component. Our results where we, where we see this like minus 0.4 in the, in the data, uh, uh, we believe could be possible that we have some kind of partially specular momentum scattering because we have so smooth silicon surfaces, not fully specular, but somewhat specular. And, and that combined with the magnetic component then would result, this, result in this uh, minus 0.4, what we see as uh, effective uh, suppression of DC. But yeah, the calculations here assume fully specular momentum scattering and then see how much the magnetic component can change that. Uh, that uh, when it's uh, it becomes active. All right, thanks. All right, uh, do we have any other questions? Silke, please. Sorry, it's again about the confinement uh, because what was mentioned before was that if you, if I understood it correctly, the confi confinement you're choosing is a very it's very uh, much below the threshold because you already expect this confinement for D over Xi not for what, for a hundred or a thousand? Where do you, where's the um, transition? So, so yeah, so first of all, if the confinement is like less than, roughly less than 10 times its coherence length, then we have, uh, we kind of stabilize B phase. So we have only A phase. Uh, percent, so we are definitely in that range. So that's one kind of kind of one threshold. But if you have like seven hundred nanometers or one micrometer, then you can also have helium three B phase stable in the sample, not only A phase. So so and the phase diagram is a bit more complicated. It's something like seen here. So these are for the seven hundred nanometer confinement, and uh, of course. If one has like several microns, like 10 microns or something, then uh, it starts to look more and more like bulk. So this, uh, I probably don't have a good picture here, 
but you wouldn't have any expected suppression of superfluidity, no matter what your boundary condition is, that your bulk properties will start to dominate over the or the surface properties. So uh, if, if there's no real threshold, it's more like a gradual change, but uh, if you go to several microns, then it becomes really hard to see any effects caused by the boundaries that it, the bulk will dominate and it will look more like a bulk, bulk helium three would look like. And if I understood everything correct, you're sort of putting the pieces together, the, uh, the, the material of the bound, because you're confining it in, in the material, but the material properties are not taken into account. It's just that they are confined uh, in terms of this coherent length. But the, it doesn't. There's no interactions, no no additional effects that you have a hard boundary as compared in in BEC physics where they just have like optical traps traps. So this kind of thing. Yes. So helium three uh, doesn't really interact with uh, any any boundary material or any any solid boundary we might we might have. So as seen, if it's magnetic boundary, it might affect uh, some some phases. And if also, if the boundary is not smooth, if you have scratches there, then it will definitely change the properties. So it will, the more rough the boundary is, the more suppression of, or more pair breaking it causes uh, even from the, from the start. And you might need more helium four to kind of hide this boundary if it's really, really rough. So we have extremely smooth boundaries. So there is nothing, no interaction happening between the, Helium three and the boundary itself by by default or or that has been minimized as much as possible. Interaction between the solid itself and the and the helium three. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, at the moment, I don't see any further questions. Um, if there are any, you can just you can just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. I see that Lev wrote on the chat that this cooling takes over a second if one can see the uh, cooling after NMR pulse takes uh, over a second. Yeah, so if you heat up the system rapidly, it will take that much time to get back to a superfluid state, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it doesn't seem like there are other questions that people would like to ask. So uh, if that is indeed the case, then I will thank uh, Petri for this very interesting presentation with lots of detail and um, also the audience for, um, for a very interesting discussion. Um, and um, I will see all, all of you hopefully in, in two weeks' time when GWAC uh, will talk about the AB transition. Yep. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for the nice questions. It was good. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.